So Shala, once again, I invite you back to this Hebrew classes. So far, we did an in-depth study on the letter of Aleph. So in today's class, we are going to cover the letter Beit. So this is the second letter. So this letter is Beit. The first letter is Aleph. And the second letter is Beit. And together, it is Aleph Bet. That's how we get the word Aleph Bet. When you take these two words, Aleph, so it sounds a sound and Bet, the sound it makes is B. So when you add these two letters, it is Ab. What is Ab? Ab is father. So what do we understand by this, by this uh, uh, insight? Jews believe that it is God who created this alphabet. So when I say alphabet, I don't mean only the two letters. It covers the entire alphabet from Aleph to Tau. So Jews believe, Jews sages believe that it is God who created uh, this 22 alphabet. Yeah, though we are reading the modern Hebrew letters, but the ancient uh, pictographs, Okay, so the Paleo Hebrew, the original letters have been created by God. So that's the reason every letter has a deep insights. So if these are just an ordinary letters, we would not have spent so much of time learning these letters. So every curve and every stroke in this letter carries a message. Praise God. And we are so privileged to learn not only the uh, language, but also the mysteries hidden in each and he every Hebrew alphabet. Praise God. Amen. Before I teach about the letter bait, let me teach you how to write this letter bet or bait. So, however, you can you can write it as a bet or bait. So one and same. Okay. Right. So this is the first stroke, and this is the second stroke. And this is the third stroke. Very simple and very easy. Also, please understand that there's a dot inside the bait. So this dot is called Dagesh. And why this dot is used? Why this dot is placed inside this letter? So when a dot is placed inside this letter, it gives a hard sound, B. Okay, B in big. B, big. But if there is no dot inside this letter, then it, it is, uh, it gives a sound, it gives a verse sound, V, V in van. So this letter gives two sounds, B sound and V sound. Okay. So the pronunciation differs based upon the dagesh that is placed inside the letter. Not only this letter, few other alphabets in the Hebrew has Dagesh. And uh, please note that in the original Torah, in the uh, original Torah doesn't have this Dagesh or Das. So if you look in the original Torah or original Torah scrolls, so they'll not have this Dagesh. This appears only in the modern Hebrew. So when you're referring to the old uh, ancient script, when you don't find uh, the Dagesh, don't get confused. Because Jews are used to this letter and they can easily make it out whether it is a, a Beth or it is a Beth. Okay. So when it makes two sound, does it mean these are two letters? No. Same letter, but it gives a two, two sounds. So sometimes in the practicing seat, you may see the Beth with the Dagesh inside and uh, you'll find a bet without a dagesh. So people get confused. So they think it is a next letter, it is another letter. No, this is not another letter. Beth and with both is same. It's only one letter. Okay, clear? Praise God. Please know that Beth is not the letter Kaf. Some letters in Hebrew looks very similar and uh, they look very confusing. As a Hebrew student, you must be able to easily identify and distinguish between the Hebrew letters. Okay, so this is the letter Beit and this is the letter Kaf. So both look very similar. Now the problem is how to distinguish between them. This is very, very important. Now I want you to notice 
the lower right corner of the both letter. So for the bet, you will see a small dash coming out of it. Can you see this? A small projection, okay? Small protrusion. So if a letter has this protrusion or a small dash coming out of it, then this letter is bait. But if the letter has no protrusion or no extension appearing, then this letter is ka. Okay. So when you read the Hebrew, when you uh, look at the script uh, letters, uh, and you must carefully observe if they have any extra strokes. So these strokes are very, very important. We'll come to know that when we read the letter uh, Yod. So there, in detail, we'll learn about these strokes. Okay. So don't get confused. For, and some people, uh, they practice this letter and not knowing that there is a protrusion here. They simply write the calf and they think it is a bet. No, though it is very similar, there's a difference. If no, no, some, no, you, you, also you must understand this. If you change a letter, you know what happens? You are changing the numerical value attached to it and you are changing the picture attached to it. And what happens when a letter, picture and a numerical value changes? No, it will change the entire the geometry uh, of the word. So that's the reason you should be very careful in giving the strokes. Now let us look at the pictograph of Beth. Uh, this is Beth. Beth is spelled as bait. So this is how you write when you want to spell the letter. So this is a letter. And if you want to spell the letter, this is how you spell Beth, Yod, and Tau. So bait. So bait, what is bait? It is in a house. Okay, so this is not only a letter, so bet is also a let a word which means house, home, dwelling, place, and or a temple. Now let me show you the ancient pictograph of this letter. So see, this is how the pictograph of the letter bet. The letter bet is evolved from this letter. So this is a house. See this letter. Can you see this picture? And this is uh, in the shape of the letter bait. So usually back in those days, so uh, houses were built like this. So this is a man section. Here is a door. This is a man's, men's section. And here is a woman's section. Very simple house. Very simple, common house. So this appears to be in the shape of a letter bait. Now look at this letter. See, this is a roof. And this is wall, and this is floor. See, so letter itself is a uh, house. So when you are writing the bed, it means it it is a house. Okay. Now let me uh, show you a few words that begins with the letter bed. So there are many words in the Bible that starts with the letter bed. Bethany. Okay, what is Bethany? It's a house of debt. See, Beth is a house. Bethany. And Bethel. What is Bethel? Bethel is a house. Beth is a house. And El is God. House of God. Bethesda. Beth is house and Bethesda is house of grace. Beth Lahem. Beth is house. Lahem is bread. Lahem is bread. House of bread. Beth Page. Okay. House of fix. Beth Saida. Okay. House of Fishing. Okay. So there are numerous words in the Bible that starts with the letter bed. So when, whenever uh, you come across this word bed, it talks about the house. Now, in the Hebrew language, grammatically, 
the Hebrew letter Beit used as a prefix for some words. So when this letter Beit is used as a prefix, it means in, at, by, among, and with. Okay, for example, let me take Psalm 76, 1. God is known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. In Israel. Okay. So, this is in Hebrew. Elohim, ba Israel, gadol, shemo. Elohim is God. Okay. This is ba Israel. We'll come to this. Gadol. Gadol is big. Gadol. We say gadol adonai. Okay. So, great God. Great or big. And uh, Shemo, Shem is name. One of the sons of Noah, Noah is Shem, Shemo. Okay, Elohim, Be Israel, Gadol, Shemo. Now, let's focus on this word Be Israel. Now, what is this Be Israel? See here, the letter Bet is used as in a prefix. See, in English, the prefix is not attached to a noun. Okay, here prefix is independent. In and Israel, both are two different words. But in Hebrew, bet it is, is a prefix, but it is included in the word. So here, prefix is not separate, it is attached to the word. Praise God. Here, bet is a prefix which means in. So uh, where do we live? We live in house, we live in bet. So that's how you remember the prefix Beth. We live in a house. So Beth is in and this is Israel. So when you say B, okay, you don't say Beth, you say B. You, uh, you spell it with the sound. The Beth gives a sound B, okay? And you don't say Ba, B, a short A sound. B, Israel. That means in Israel. So take any word and attach the Beth to it as a prefix. It makes as an in, in Israel. Okay. But how to say house of Israel? Then you need to spell it as a word. Beth, Yod, and Tau. So this is Beit. You write it as a word. When you write it as a word, it is house. So house of Israel. So this should be read as house of Israel, not B Israel. This is not in Israel. This is house of Israel. Okay. Don't worry. I don't, I'll not take uh, into deep. So these things are covered in grammar classes. Okay. Just for information's sake, I'm teaching you this. Let me give you another example. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. See, in the beginning, if you look into the Hebrew, this is the word. Barashit. Okay, Barashit in the beginning. So here the letter Beth is used as a prefix, which means in and Rashit is beginning. Rashit is beginning. If you look Genesis 10 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So if you look at this word beginning, it is Rashit. Okay, so Barashit, what is the meaning of Barashit? Okay, in the beginning. Okay, so the first word bit is a prefix here. Let's go back to the book of Genesis 1 1. So, in fact, Genesis is not a Hebrew name, Genesis is a Greek name. Okay. So the book, the name of this book in Hebrew is Bereshit. So why Bereshit? Because this is the first word of the Hebrew. Bereshit is the first word of the Hebrew. That's why this book is named as Bereshit. Now, in the Torah, there are 17 occasions where the letter is printed either in large or smaller than the surrounding letters. There are 17 uh, such instances or occasions. Either they are printed large or small. I mean, this you don't find in our uh, web versions or mobile apps, or if you buy a Hebrew Bible, there you don't find. 
only this enlarged letters or diminished letters can be found only in the Torah scrolls. So why they are written like that? There are 17 occasions, different letters in 17 occasions. Now, when the letter is big, and uh, this created a lot of question in the Jewish people's mind, why this letter is so big? Some people think, okay, maybe it is a capital letter. Some get confused, maybe because it's a cap. Because if you read in English paper, the first letters begin with the okay, big letter and following the small letters. Only the first letter will be so big. So people think this is a capital letter. Please understand, in Hebrew, there are no capital letters and small letters. But then why this letter bet is in big in size? And people think it is a printer's uh, trick. It's a printer's trick. So uh, maybe by mistake, they would have written in a big size. No, no, no. Scribes, with the utmost care, they write the Torah. No, they, when they write the Torah, they are, they, they are so diligent. They'll be very careful in writing the Torah. You know how much care they take when they're writing the Torah. If, for example, if they give, if they fail to give a, a small stroke here, can you see the projection here? Small protrusion. By mistake, if they fail to give the small protrusion here, this becomes calf and it becomes karashit. So even if a small stroke is missing, or if an extra stroke is given to a particular letter, you know what scribe do? They tear off entire scroll and they'll start from first. Usually, when we make a mistake when uh, in taking down the notes, so we'll we'll strike off the wrong letter or a wrong word, and uh, we'll either we write uh, on top or beneath the the correct word. But scribes will never do that. They'll never make the adjustment. One stroke is missed. Their entire scroll is been put away. So they'll be very cautious. If the letter is big, they have to write as it is. If the letter is so small, they have to write very small. They cannot change the letter uh, according to their convictions. Now the question is, why the letter is so big here? And that too, the first word in the Torah. First word in the first chapter of the first book, why this letter is in large. So when a uh, Jewish Shager says that, whenever a word in the Torah has a letter of a different size, it signifies that another important interpretation must be looked for. So just don't look at it as a word. It has another inter interpretation in it. It has another insight hidden in it. Now, why this letter is baked? Of course, there are many speculations and there are many reasons that scholars give, but among which one reason I find is very apt here. I'm presenting it before you. Now, listen very carefully. We learned that Beth is a house, but here the Beth is so large. So that means, this is not an ordinary house. Beth is a house, but here it is very large. It means it is not an ordinary house. It is God's house. It is God's house. So before God creating anything, Jewish scholars believe that God created a house for himself. <laughs> this looks very crazy to you, very strange to you, but this is what Jews believe. Then you may think, oh, will God need a house to dwell? In the John Gospel, Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. So father has a house. Okay. So before he created anything, he created a house for himself. See, every other letter proceeds from this letter, Beth. So here, Beth, uh, it is, like, op it, it is uh, like opening its mouth where everything proceeds from this letter bed. So everything proceeds from the house of God. Whatever comes, comes from the house of God. Now get this. So why he is creating a house here? Why he is creating a house? What is the purpose of creating a house? You know, get this. God is very big. He is very gigantic, very huge. 
and heaven and earth cannot contain contain him he fills the entire universe he fills the entire galaxies so big is our god such a big god such a big huge god now such an infinite god when he is creating a bed he is trying to enter into the finite realm why because eventually he is going to create a man and he loves to be with man he wants to be with man he wants to be in fellowship with man so to create a man so he is the infinite god is entering into the finite realm he he has to reduce himself and he has to enter into the finite realm so to create something okay to create see for example he is infinite term, right so he fills everything so full that nothing else could exist but him now if he has to create something god has to reduce himself now here god is creating a finite realm called galaxy finite realm called the universe finite realm called the earth now he's entered into the finite realm and now he he created adam where he walked into the garden of eden he had a fellowship with adam and eve he spoke to them oh there's a there's a beautiful relationship between god and man he spoke to man and man 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 spoke to god there's a beautiful exchange of words that's wonderful right and bible says he walked in the garden so god entered into the finite realm he reduced himself so that he is approachable to god so that he is reachable to god so that he can fellowship with man see how great our god is he's, on one side he is so gigantic so large on the same side he can reduce himself so that he is approachable to man what a great god we serve right who other god can reduce himself to the level of man i don't find any other god here beautiful god he is reducing himself praise god that's the reason this letter beth has a crown here the letter beth has a crown can you see that so these are the small tagins it's like a crown on the letters so some hebrew letters have the crown on them let me tell you what is this crowns so can you see this letter this is the letter zayin for example this is the letter zayin we'll come to know when we reach that particular letter don't worry okay just for a side note i'm explaining you this and in the torah scrolls such a letters have this crowns this is also called as a tagin okay this you don't find in web versions or mobile apps only in the printed version only in the torah scrolls even these are very very important even this teach a valuable insights for us for others this look as a decorative items but these are not the decorative things even this has a very important uh, insights so something these are vowels because they are like dots on top of them <laughs> these are not vowels these are called as crowns so in aramaic it is called as tagin in hebrew it is called as keter what is keter keter is crown keter is crown okay so not every letter has this tag in so keter eight hebrew letters how many eight hebrew letters are given special decoration by attaching tag in eight among 22 letters have this tag in what are they so these letters collectively are called sha'at nazgets so this is not a hebrew word so this is an acronym to remember these eight letters okay what is sha'at nazget sish yes this sh is shin letter shin a is ayin and here t is tet okay and uh, n is noon z is zain z email and ts is sade okay how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 but here only there are seven letters but 
I said eight Hebrew letters, but here there are only seven. Why? Because Sade Sofit letter also has a crown. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating. Sade has a Sofit letter. If you remember the Sofit letter, Sade is one of the Sofit letter. So even and Sade first form has a crown and Sade final form also has a crown. So when you take as a letter, there are only seven here in Sharna's gate. If you include, if you include the final form of Sade, then it becomes eight. Okay. So only these letters have the taggings. But here Beth has the tagging here. There is an exception in the Torah scroll that very first letter Beth, very first letter Beth receives the crown. Not all the time, not all the time. The very first time, the first letter Beth receives the crown. So this is not a ordinary house. This is the house of God. See, remaining letters are so small. Here, Beth is so big. It is a house of God. Now, let's talk about the reduced Aleph. I have something to say here. It's very, very important. Don't worry, I'm going to connect to the letter Beit. In the Torah scroll, Aleph at one occurrence, it appears so small. Leviticus, first chapter, verse 1. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, okay, now get this. In English, you read, now the Lord called. Now what do you understand? Okay, you say, okay, Lord called Moses, that's it. But there's a deep mystery here. And it gives a great light about our Jesus here. Now I want you to clear, carefully observe this word in Hebrew. Now the Lord called in Hebrew it is Vaikra. 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 Now, now what do you observe here? Here you see Aleph is so small. So when a scribe writes the scroll when he comes to Aleph he should not write Aleph as an ordinary letter. No. If he writes like this by mistake, he has to throw away the scroll. He is not supposed to write like that. So if the Aleph is small in the Torah scroll, when he is making the manuscript, when he is writing the manuscript, even he has to write the Aleph very small. So why here Aleph is very small? Also, you see this Aleph is elevated. Here, his Aleph is elevated here. It is hanging above. It is elevated. Why it is like that? Now, let me tell you an insight here. The book of Leviticus is a continuation to the book of Exodus. There's a reason. Say here in Leviticus 1.1, 1, 1, now the Lord called. But if no, in Hebrew is Vaikra, this wow, this is a letter wow, and wow is a nail, and it is used to attach two letters or two words or two sentences. Okay, so here wow is and. What does the and do? It attaches two words. So in in original script, it is it is va ikra and the Lord called to Moses. And so when the book begins with the and, that means it is a connection to the previous book, which is the book of Exodus. That's a continuation. We think it's a different book. No, it's a continuation. So now before we look into this Vaikra, something has happened in the book of Exodus. God called Moses. So when God came down, and he had a fellowship with man, and man fell in sin. He lost the relation with God. But when man lost the connection with God, but no, one good thing is God didn't give up. So he is trying to restore mankind back to himself. He is after the man, praise God. So God never created another Adam or Eve. He could have created, 
he could have created another adam and eve he could have created another world but our god is so loving that when something is broken he'll try to fix it then replace it our god is a god of restoration no in our lives when something is broken we try to take it away we try to throw it away or we try to give up or we go after something new is same thing happen even in the, in the marriages when marriage life is not working out they change they try to change the partner they try to change they look they try to look after the some, someone else looking for something new when you're lost god didn't replace you he restored you see if something is broken in your life if something is lost in your life connect to alif he can restore everything back to you when even earth was in void void and in shapeless he recreated the world we serve the god of restoration i don't know what is broken in your life what is lost in your life what is uh, messed up in your life now when alif gets involved when alif is in your life he can recreate everything he can recreate your life so beautiful amen okay now when man lost his connection now here god is telling moses moses yes sir make me a sanctuary by the time they are already left egypt and they are on the way to the promised land now here god says make me a sanctuary make me a sanctuary why mm-hmm. that i may dwell among them i may dwell among them now i want you to look this word dwell what is the hebrew word for dwell it is shakan that's how you get the word shakina 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 so shakan is to dwell so god wants to dwell once he lost the fellowship with man i mean man lost the fellowship with god now again he is taking another step where he can come down and dwell among his people god always loves to have a fellowship with man so much he loves the mankind and he says build a tabernacle bible says he built according to the pattern he god gave the pattern exact pattern on the mount sinai he gave the okay what should be the bed what should be the width what should be the height what are the colors that should be used okay which side should be on which thing every he gave the clear blueprint moses should neither add or delete anything from it he has to execute the plan exactly which god has showed it, showed to him when the tabernacle is built according to the pattern now get this now get this when he finished building the tabernacle the word of god says in exodus 40th chapter was 34 glory filled the tabernacle the glory of god descended on the tabernacle and moses himself was unable to go inside the same moses who saw the glory in the mount sinai the same moses who was with the lord for 40 days twice the same moses who saw the glory and felt the presence of god on the mount sinai he was able to be there in the mount sinai but here the presence was so powerful than on mount sinai here he himself couldn't enter into the tabernacle you know why because the tabernacle was built according to the pattern of course this tabernacle points to jesus christ uh, uh, god gave me the grace to write a book on the tabernacle of moses of course i wrote in my mother tongue telugu it is available in telugu but soon i'm trying to bring it out in english so there i covered lot of mysteries i covered even the small details of the ta- tabernacle and how it is pointing to our savior our christ so when did the glory descend on the tabernacle before the glory there was a pattern so there's a pattern followed by the glory let me tell you one thing if you want to see the glory see now people they are always crazy and they always wants to be filled by the glory of god they always pray they always be so desperate god fill me with the glory fill me with the glory let me tell you just just because you sang god fill me with the glory god is not going to fill you just because you jump here and there just because you are rolling on the floor god doesn't go to fill you with his glory you know when, when does the glory appear if go, if you want to see the glory first there should be a pattern in your life everything should be in order 
Everything should be not in perfect order. So when there is an order, there will be a glory descending on it. If there is no order, I'm very sorry. If your life is in disorder, if your uh, timetable is in disorder, if your lifestyle is in disorder, you don't know when you'll rise up, when you sleep, when you go back to sleep, when you study the Bible, when you, even you don't understand about yourself. There is no order at all in your life. There is no order in your life. If there is no order in your life, if there is no systematic life, sorry, God cannot operate in such lives. Our God is a God of an order. He's a God of order. He follows order. Look from, uh, from the book of the uh, Genesis to the Revelation. You see his pattern. You see his work, you see a work style. He is perfect in his timings and seasons. If you want to see the glory filling your life, put your life in order. If your life is broken, if your altars are broken, repair them, bring them into the order, bring them into the perfection, put streamline everything. Then he asks God, then he's going to fill the temple. Then you ask God to fill your life, your family. Why there's no presence of God in the family? Because there is no order. Why the church is missing the revival? Because there is no order. I'm not talking, when I say order, I'm not talking about the program sheet. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. The order that God uh, gave in the scriptures. Praise God. Okay. So now Moses finished his work and the glory descended on the tabernacle. So what does this has uh, to do with this Vaikra, this Hebrew word? Now, look at this letter Aleph. What is Aleph? Aleph is God's letter. It is God. Now, such a uh, great God, the God who fills the entire universe and galaxies, even heaven and earth cannot contain him. So big he is. So, such a big God, if he has, if he has to enter into the tabernacle, can he bring Complete of himself into the tabernacle. No. So to enter into the tabernacle, to, to fill the tabernacle with his presence and glory, to be among the people of God, God has to reduce himself. He has to reduce himself. Praise God. That's the reason here Aleph has become so small here. Wow. Glory to God. You know, we know that no man can stand in his full glory. Yes, even man cannot live seeing his glory, seeing his presence. The moment he's tried to see, he's dead and gone. Now here, Aleph, he's reducing himself and he's, he's dwelling among the people. What a humble God, right? What a loving God. He loves his people. He's reducing himself and, and he came and dwelt among the people. Praise God. Now, this happened uh, in the Old Testament. But still, God wants to be more closer to man. Though God was dwelling among the people, though the temple is built, though sacrifices have been offered, but still, man, okay, so he's still far away from God. So time to time, God has given the directions, the statues, the laws, the decrees. God started giving everything, but still man is moving away from God. He's disappointing God. Somehow the relation between man and God, still it is stained. And the sin started to take over the man. Now something has happened. Listen very carefully. Who is this Aleph? You know, this Aleph is none other Jesus himself. He is the reduced Aleph. 2000 years back, the great God emptied himself. Philippians second chapter verse 6, uh, the word of God says, uh, the same Aleph that created entire universe, uh, the same Aleph that created Adam and Eve, uh, the same Aleph that dwelt among the people, that dwelt um, the, the, that who came down and filled the uh, temple with his glory, the same Aleph, he emptied himself. 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, not just a servant. There's a difference between a servant and a bond servant. He emptied himself and he, he came like a, uh, in the likeness of man. He emptied himself and he came down and is born in this world in a manger in a manger no he emptied himself the great aleph he emptied him because if he has to enter into this world and dwell among the people he has to reduce himself see the love of god he loves man so much than his reputation than his image than his position he loves man now where is man is always running after the fame name no he's going to any extent he's doing all kind of nonsense he's spoiling the relationships for him name and fame is important but here see look at god he has the riches he has the praises in heaven all the angelic hosts are worshiping before god entire creation worship him but still he left everything and he reduced himself and he's born in a manger. Here, Aleph is a reduced Aleph. You know, we all knew that how he led his life. At one point, he washed his disciples' feet. The hands that created the entire universe, the hand that created the entire thing, the same hands, now it is washing the feet of his disciples. The same hands is wiping the feet of disciples. Can you see the, uh, uh, the humbleness of Christ here? What a great God is, sir. What a loving God. He's not God sir, who is sitting somewhere and passing the rules, dictating, controlling people, uh, putting, uh, giving a set of rules. No, no. We are not serving such kind of a God. The God who is an example for us in reducing and serving the people. Here we see the beautiful God, beautiful Savior humble, humbling his, himself. Even when uh, he's going through the crucifixion process, it was so idle. He could speak of himself, but still he couldn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't do that because, yes, the blood should be shed on the, shed on the cross. He humbled himself. Amen? Okay. Now, We are going to see this word Vaikra. There's a beautiful message here. Here, you see Aleph elevated. Why this Aleph is elevated? I'm going, to, I'm going to explain that. So when it is used as a prefix, it is it gives a meaning and. And, and this word, taking these three letters, you can form a word, Ikar. And the meaning of this word is esteem or honor. I have given you the strong number, double three, double six. You can try that. So the meaning of this word is esteem and honor. Now, what is the message you get here? And he honored Aleph. And he, your is a, is a he. We'll come to know that when we reach the grammar class. And he honored Aleph. And he honored Aleph. Praise God. And you know, when Jesus humbled himself, he committed himself. When he reduced himself, gave his life on the cross, submitted, sub and he endured all the pain and suffering, humiliations. And God raised him. Philippians 2nd chapter verse 9, the word of God says, Therefore God has, all, has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Praise God. Father exalting his son. And he honored Aleph. This is under the meaning of Vaikra. He honored Aleph because son humbled himself and he's exalted. Dear beloved, dear uh, beloved child of God, who is exalted? The one who humbles himself. God always exalts the humble, but resists the proud. Here, Jesus is exalted. 
now everyone loves to be exalted everyone loves to be on the high places everyone loves to be in the limelight everyone loves to be acknowledged and identified but before god gives you the elevation first he sees you whether you are submitting yourself whether you have a submissive nature in you the humble will receive the grace but god resists the proud here i can see alif be elevated here i can see the father uh, exalting his son jesus christ wow glory to god learning something learning something praise god amen okay let's move on let's learn something about the house of jacob let me ask you this question who is the house of jacob in exodus 19 the chapter was 3 and moses went up to god and the lord called to him from the mountain saying the okay thus you shall say to this house of jacob and tell the children of israel so who who is the house of jacob not only the jews but there are other people who are included in this group let me show you this if you read exodus 12th chapter see in exodus 19th chapter here god is telling moses where at the mountain he is telling okay now Uh, you shall say to the house of jacob now you tell the house of jacob so whoever are there in the wilderness the multitudes the congregation okay so everyone are counted as a house of jacob now if you read exodus 12th chapter verse 37 when people left egypt who are left number one the children of israel those who applied the blood on their doorpost the jews the children of god israelites who applied the blood on their doorpost so they came out of egypt they are delivered along with them if you read verse 38 a mixed multitude went up with them not only jews even a mixed multitude journeyed with them this is a mixed multitude here so they acknowledged that god is a true god so even they left egypt and they traveled along with the children of israel so there are two groups here so what is the house of jacob house of jacob includes both physical descendants of abraham isaac and jacob also the mixed multitude also the mixed multitude so this mixed multitudes are no no the, the thora says they are the strangers they are the sojourners they are adopted and they are grafted they are grafted okay so these are the a definition given by the thora about this mixed multitude some of them grafted in the jews okay this both is called as the house of jacob okay now get this there's a prophecy about our yeshua messiah there's a prophecy about our our savior if you read luke first chapter verse 32 the word of god says he will reign over the house of jacob now what is the house of jacob the house of jacob includes both jews and gentiles who are grafted in the judaism who are grafted in the lord who are grafted who acknowledge that god is the savior god is the true god jehovah is the true god so those are the house of jacob and uh, whom jesus is going to reign over he is going to reign over the house of jacob it means that's why if you read the book of if you read the genealogy of christ his genealogy consists of both jews and gentiles if you read matthew first chapter you see the list you, you, you see the genealogy list there covering both jews and gentiles like ruth and rahab ruth and rahab he is going he is a god of israel and is a god of gentiles praise god amen praise god we are like a sojourners we were aliens but we are grafted in god praise god we were uh, we were aliens to the covenant we are not born in the covenant we are aliens to the covenant but 
when we realize that jehovah is a true god savior is a true god yeshua messiah is the savior of this world we believe and we accept it and we decided to follow jesus and when we when we when we uh, put our faith in christ and what happened you are grafted you are grafted in god in the same trunk praise god for that and god is a god of israel is a god of jacob also is a god of gentiles some people deny okay jesus is a god for the christians so why do we need him jehovah is a god for the jews so why do we need him he is not our god no no when bible says the house of jacob it includes both jews and those who are grafted in them that's what paul develops in the book of romans about the grafting if you have if you if you have a time just go through his epistle he talks about the grafting and some people they always uh preach about the replacement theology and you know we don't support the replacement theology on one side yes he is working on the gentiles on the other side he didn't forsake jews he didn't forsake jews throughout the study we are going to learn how we god is going to, god is handling the gentiles those who are grafted in him also we are going to see how god is handling the jews just because the just because the church is born just because it is called the bride of christ it doesn't mean that god forsook the jews he has he has his way own way of handling those jews we are going to see that also we are going to see why jews at this particular moment why they are not unable to acknowledge jesus each class as we progress we are going to uncover a lot of things and we are going to see the plan of god we are going to see the heart of god we are going to see uh, where god uh, how god is up to and how, and how god is handling the things that's the reason i always insist people follow my classes thoroughly every let, let every class has a connection so if you are not following the classes consistently you are missing something amen so what is beth beth is a house okay so uh, we are not done with this letter so in the next class we are going little deeper i have a lot of other mysteries to teach so we are going little deeper and uh, as we are talking about the letter beth we are going to focus on the house and the house has a lot of things to teach us if you want god to work in your life to work in your relationships please don't miss out this next class and god has told a lot of things for you